Thank you all for joining me here today. And we're going to be talking about smart cities and converging the offline with the online experience. Now, when I think about that, I think about things that I suppose are relevant to my life that might be ordering a pizza online or perhaps it's dialing up a ride sharing service and traveling somewhere or even it could be talking to um, a, a doctor over the internet and then picking up my prescription in the w real world. But Brendan, I suppose at Fifth Wall you see a lot of very interesting business proposals across your desk and these are the sort of companies that you're investing in. What are the um, really exciting services that you're seeing that are crossing over that divide? Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely see a lot of companies that are taking a, a service um, that has historically had a location. So it's instantiated in a particular location. And now with on-demand, kind of your location is somewhat amorphous. Anything you want or any service can hypothetically come to you. And two things that we've seen recently a rapid growth of is these concepts of phantom restaurants where uh, there's so much food now being ordered online that it's actually overwhelming the the traditional locations themselves. They're not designed to handle commissary-like production of food and pickup. So a lot of restaurants are actually moving to these large-scale, industrial-scale commissary kitchens that have multiple lines with like a very efficient pickup. Um, so it, it's really interesting that certain restaurants now don't even have locations. So brands that people are becoming familiar with and ordering from regularly are now location-less. They just have a centralized industrial food production facility. Another concept that's kind of along those same lines is um, on-demand self-storage, which has also grown very, very quickly. Self-storage is something that is traditionally had a very clear location. Most people store their items very close to where they live, usually within five miles of where they live. But now there are many services, uh, one in particular in the US called Clutter, that picks up your stuff from your home, packs it, puts it on trucks, and stores it remotely in a large industrial warehouse far outside the city. So it's kind of like a real estate company, except it is effectively locationless. It is literally like your items are stored in the cloud. Um, and I think there's very clear implications for physical space and, and, and zoning as a result. So one aspect of all of this that interests me, and I think we've got an audience um, participation question that will appear on the screen, is in the future, what sort of um, impact will this have upon uh, communities and I suppose neighbourhoods and societies? Because often towns and when um, town planners are planning this sort of thing, they um, operate around a hub and a community environment. But if everyone can pretty much do everything just from their computer and not really leave their house or their office environment, I wonder what sort of impact that is going to have upon society. Um, I think we might have an audience uh, participation question on that, but perhaps while we're waiting for that to come up, um, what, are your, what are your thoughts, Brendan? Yeah, I think there's absolutely implications that people are not walking to go get food or store things or get a particular service that has big implications for what's traditionally thought of as like mixed use development. It's so heavily premised on that. Um, I think there's even broader implications, which is like, how do you actually design buildings? Uh, buildings are not designed, at least historically, to handle the volume of deliveries they're getting today. And so there's a lot of makeshift solutions, but I think very few people are predicting the kind of exponential growth of things being delivered to you, either people or goods or services. Um, so there's a lot that I think city planners have to think about. Have to think about, certainly. Ambassador, I know you've had some interesting experience in this regard, and I'd like to hear um, your thoughts on this, uh, particularly um, the, the Danish experience, which is sort of held up a lot in this regard, is doing, doing this very well. Well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if I may, a little self-advertisement to begin with. Uh, Denmark has been topping the, uh, the uh, e-government index this year and has also consistently been uh, one of the most digitalized countries in Europe. And, and this is uh, a result of the fact that we have always been quite positive about uh, technology, but not technology in its own right. Uh, we don't feel that technology has any value in itself. So what is important is how you actually use it, how you apply it. Not so great. Maybe better. We'll try. Can you still hear me? 
Okay, great. So, so. Okay. <laughs> then you can have a nice rest after a long morning if it doesn't pass through. <laughs> no, so uh, technology is not a, a valuable thing in itself, it's how you use it. And I think if Denmark is known for anything, it's a design. You all know the Lego bricks and other types of Danish design. Uh, and that also applies to how we go about designing uh, public spaces, cities and digital solutions. So we focus on a human-centric design and putting the people in, in control. Human-centric design. Let me give you a couple of examples of what that means for the kind of solutions that we come out with. In the city of Copenhagen, uh, we aim to become carbon neutral in 2025. And this is kind of a tall order, I think, for any city, also for Copenhagen. And we try to apply some of our technological solutions to, to deliver that. And when it comes to merging online and, and offline uh, services, one of the ways we do that is that we have, in a public-private partnership, developed an app that can combine both your public sector travel with your private travel. So whether you want to go on a harbor ferry, or you want to take the bus or the metro, the train, or you want to go carpooling or find a car that's not in use somewhere in Copenhagen you can take for the day, or you want to use one of the city's free bikes, then you go onto one app and all these solutions are there real time. So this saves uh, energy and makes the most convenient way to use the city and enables people to use uh, the, the common good instead of each having their own car. So it also improves livability. That's one example. And to, uh, to also explain how this also can lead to more inclusiveness, I can mention another example from uh, the city of uh, Odense in, in Denmark, our third largest city. Here we've done an experiment uh, on fitting GPS trackers on homeless people who were marginalized in the city to see how they walk around the city, of course with their approval and active participation in, in the project. The idea was we needed to find out how they move so we, we know where we can make space for them in order to give them a dignified life and places to stay uh, out of the public space and also to reduce uh, nuisance, noise and trash that was otherwise left in spaces uh, where they didn't have anywhere fit, suitable to be. The result was actually incredibly positive. We were able to find the right spaces and they felt empowered and part of society in the way that their needs were taken into account. The whole big brother watching issue that could have come up was actually never really a factor in this project. That's a lovely example. And I think, you know, when we think about technology infiltrating all aspects of our life, life one of the, the worries that sometimes people have is it's creating the technology haves and the technology have nots. But I guess this is a, an example where it's actually bringing people together and solving that problem to a degree. Jenny, I know your expertise is in the network side of things, which of course are the things that we don't see or don't think about. They're the invisible part of all of this, but when they go wrong, <laughs> it's what everyone complains about. So can you speak a little bit about your experience and how you're working with a lot of cities globally um, to, to make sure that networks do what they're supposed to? I mean, people-centric in the, in the way we work basically really means that, first of all, the, the technology and the infrastructure that you need to make the use cases of the individuals work and, and you wanted to order a pizza in the beginning, um, that you can do that and that everything that you need um, to get your pizza delivered um, is actually there, be it on the energy side, be it on the grid side, um, be it on transportation, somehow the pizza should get delivered to you, ideally in a, in a hot uh, condition. Yeah. Um, we want to we wanna make sure that the building you're living in um, is, is having the, the right um, conditions for you. And that's all in the back. So basically, if we're doing our job good, you, you don't even see it and you don't feel it. And there are a lot of challenges for the cities. They are very city specific. So it's important for every city to find out what are these challenges and, and what are the best ways and also to overcome that. And maybe speaking about Copenhagen, and you already mentioned um, our, our city performance tool study that we did together with the city in order to make sure that Copenhagen gets um, CO2 neutral by 2025. For example, in Copenhagen, the, the biggest lever was on the buildings and the building automation. And that can differ from city to city. In other cities, it's really um, a topic on transportation. And that's something you have to find out. And for that, you have to um, understand the city. You have to understand um, the technology. And the technology today, obviously, is on the one hand on the infrastructure side, but then also on the digital solutions and connecting the right data and having the right use cases and also to solving the more smarter challenges of a city.
And Jenny, I know when we were talking earlier, we were talking about the, the need to be proactive in this respect from a, from a government point of view, because you mentioned some cities that have been forced to, to come to this party, like D Detroit, I think you mentioned, was one of them. Um, what, what would your message be to regulators and governments um, around the world when they're thinking about this sort of thing, how they can change their citizens' lives? But of course, there are all these other concerns like cyber security or, or other, other threats when networks are, are, are pervasive. I mean, it is, it is a challenge and, and I always really um, have a lot of respect for all the mayors who are dealing with such a huge area of topics, it's so much, and actually the technology is only one piece of their daily job again. Um, so I, I understand that it is very tough. Um, I believe what, what we see all around the world is cities are approaching their challenges in a different way. Some of them are really starting on a use case basis, so they would pick one specific topic and work on this. And in some cases, it's a rather small topic. It can be around smart lighting or smart trash canning, so really one, one piece. Um, but then we see other cities that have a more holistic approach, that really have sort of their digital roadmap, that, that, that have a vision, and that really very proactively drive this vision, that from the beginning on are in control of what's happening there, that have a clear picture of where they want to go, that are owning then also the data, that are sh proactively shaping the algorithms. And I personally believe in, a, in the future future when we have maybe fully automated cities where the infrastructure is really um, being run based on algorithms. I, I think it's, if I were a city, I would want to make sure that I'm driving the way towards this, this vision and not um, let others do that. And, and Brendan, you uh, are dealing a lot with private capital, I suppose. So what are your views on, on the government's role in, in facilitating the online to offline services? Um, well, you know, there's, there's one example, actually, that's very close to home for us. Um, I imagine people are familiar with the growth, at least in the US, of scooter sharing. It's something that I think took everyone by surprise. Uh, kind of overnight, these scooters became pervasive in cities. Consumer adoption was faster than ride sharing. It was dramatic. Um, and so on the one hand, you'd, you'd think, well, cities should love this. It is clearly reducing the amount of automobile traffic, which generally should be a good thing, reducing parking, reducing wear and tear on infrastructure. There are certain public health implications, right? If people are you know, riding on sidewalks or blocking pedestrian passageways, um, real estate owners love it. Um, they really like it, in part because it encourages um, just more foot traffic to areas that oftentimes people would just get in and out of a car. Um, and so one of the things we look for in situations like that are where locally influential real estate owner operators can influence a city, in part because they're often the most influential at the local level. Um, and that has been a slow process, I'd say, in, in California, but you're starting to see more progress where cities are now actually um, putting in regulations that allow for scooter sharing. And as you said um, before, it is changing um, the landscape of real estate, you know, buildings that can't cope with the number of deliveries. Do you also see uh, that changing the makeup of, for example, shopping malls? Um, if people are are getting a lot of services online, then I suppose tenants in shopping malls are not getting the foot traffic that they might have otherwise. And so um, I know in Singapore, we've started to see the makeup of shopping malls changing. And now there are things like yoga studios or um, cinemas or quite smart restaurants in shopping malls to encourage consumers to actually spend more time there. Is this a trend that you're seeing as well? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot made of you know the, the death of retail mm. that you read a lot about. Um, I think it's probably overstated. It's mainly the death of old line retailers. Um, malls are still, you know, these agglomerations of different services and products that, that consumers want. It's a very convenient way to access them, even if they're buying those same products online. What I think you've seen is a lot of malls are shifting more towards being more experiential. So greater emphasis on food and beverage or entertainment We've seen esports studios going into malls and a lot of emphasis on what, what I think you're talking about, which is kind of next gen healthcare or wellness or fitness, basically services that you literally cannot replicate online. 
um, that have this recurring use case for consumers. And malls are increasingly attracting that because they have this natural kind of command and control environment where they can curate the, the retailers in a way that street level retail really can't. They're usually individually owned stores who don't have the same incentive to give and take and curate appropriately. Mm. And Ambassador, um, maintaining public spaces and encouraging people to use them is something that you often hear cities in um, Europe and especially Northern Europe have done very well. So this has obviously been something that's been thought of early on in the planning process. Can you speak a little bit about your experience? I think that uh, it comes from the same vein of thought about being uh, human-centric and in actually including the people in what they want, not just what you're able to do and what you're able to deliver, but ask them what they want. And try and make sure that all the, the public space is used for something that's inclusive and encourages people to spend time together to avoid that people are sitting at home and eating their pizza alone. Uh, and one such thing, for instance, in Copenhagen is um, one of our utilities. It's um, it's a facility that burns rubbish and then the, the heat is transported into our district heating system to heat up homes. And this is an usually not a very nice building. It's lying on the outskirts of town. But we wanted it to be closer to home so there was less loss of uh, heat transmission. And, uh, and in order to facilitate that, we got the Danish uh, famous architect Bjarke Ingels to design it in a new way, reimagining it together with the people who lived in the area. And now it's a ski slope in Copenhagen so that you can ski down the, the hill of this uh, incineration plant. And it in, has even developed a facility where it can make smoke rings from the big chimney to make it more enjoyable. And so I think making it a destination instead of just making it uh, an, an ugly building. And I think that's the same that goes for retail. They try to make shopping a destination where there's uh, entertainment. In Denmark, we do that very much by getting people into nature. And so you see, for instance, how you grow your, your food or you participate in, in, in finding uh, mussels in the sea or whatever, and that's part of the, the destination. Then you sign up for an online service to have it delivered afterwards. And we've just um, got a few minutes left, so a question, if I may, that I'll um, ask all of you to answer. If you can sort of shut your eyes and think maybe 15, 20 years from now, what are some services that you think will be purely online that we will never do in the real world? And conversely, what are things that will always remain um, human to human? I've thrown that one in there, Brendan. <laughs> um, I think st any staple good, um, so any kind of, you know, anything you can buy that's just more convenient to buy on Amazon, I think you can make the assumption is going to be purchased online. Um, Go, going back, and this is maybe a kind of answer to your question, something that I think a lot of people are not thinking about when they think about what's happening offline, you still have to get packages, um, which is a, a big issue. And the way we get packages is very likely to change over the next couple decades. And it very likely won't be a terrestrial solution. It very likely will be an aerial solution, which has a whole host of public, private, uh, airspace concerns um, that I think most cities are not thinking about at all. But that is still a, a, a kind of fundamental question, which is how do things you buy online get to you? And I think everyone's mind is thinking about the front door and not the roof. Yes, yes, very interesting. Ambassador? Well, one thing I think will be fully online is money. Uh, in Copenhagen, I don't think I've had cash in my hand for the last three years. So I think it will go, and I think there are so many great technical solutions out there, so it's a matter of, of gaining enough trust in them to be able to, to roll them out fully. Uh, something that will always be in the physical space is human interaction. I mean, however much we try to have Skype and so on, there's no substitute for being able to read people's uh, facial expressions and signals, so human contact and spending time together will never be fully online. That's good to hear, and Jenny? I really believe that everything will be online. Where I would see the change is actually that you can also sell something online. So to give you an example, already today, we have installed a peer-to-peer -peer network in Brooklyn. So basically, in this neighborhood, the neighbors are already trading energy with each other. So if you have your solar cell on your rooftop and uh, you have too much energy at that stage because you only need it at night, um, I could 
sort of sell it to you and you could bake a cake in the, in the afternoon. So I think that's maybe more the change, that you also become a prosumer and that you can also offer certain things then um, online. And in terms of what stays, I would fully relate to you. I, um, I really believe, and I mean, there are studies out there that are also proving this, that social interaction is, is particularly important and it's also important in a city's context because people feel much more safe, they feel simply better and, and I, so I believe a smart city should also be a happy city and for that we kind of need social interaction.